and gentlemen, I'm very excited today. We have a very special guest. We're going to get into some deep stuff about DAI and DeFi, um, all the way from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Bienvenido a nuestro programa, Mariano Conti. Welcome, my friend. How are you today, sir? Um, very good. Thank you so much for uh, that intro. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, we appreciate you coming on today's show. Obviously, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, some of them about the DeFi space. And with you being the head of smart contracts at MakerDAO, um, I, I feel like you'd have some awesome insights. So for, for those of you who don't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you exactly do there at MakerDAO? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I lead the smart contracts team, which is um, you know, the team that is responsible for uh, writing, testing, and uh, maintaining the protocol, the MakerDAO protocol that runs on the Ethereum blockchain. So the actual smart contracts that di uh, dictate the logic of what uh, the Maker protocol and the DAI stablecoin is, as well as, uh, you know, upgrades and improvements, uh, my team is in, in charge of that. So it's, uh, it's a big responsibility. Yes, I, I could imagine. I mean, that's kind of the, the most foundational element of, of a lot of what the space is doing. So now, what, were, what exactly were you doing uh, before you got involved with MakerDAO? And where's your background exactly? Um, so I, I studied computer science um, in Mexico because I was living uh, there a few years ago. Then I moved back um, to Buenos Aires. I was working different jobs. I was at a digital agency here and my boss, he couldn't, he wanted to pay me a part of my salary in dollars to, um, to hedge against inflation, but uh, he couldn't pay me directly. He could pay me via a bank account. You know, there were capital controls. There was no easy access to dollars. So we discovered Bitcoin and he started paying me Bitcoin. This was in late 2014. And uh, that's also when we discovered Ethereum. And when it launched in 2015, we went all in and tried to find a project to work with. And my boss discovered Maker. So we started um, subcontracting uh, for Maker until um, I, I joined the project directly. So it was like a series of uh, lucky events. Huh. But the main reason was using cryptocurrency to, um, to protect myself from the Argentinian economy. Right. And that's definitely something I am very curious to learn about because um, with you actually going through this in Argentina, I feel like there's, there's a lot of similarities that are going to be coming up for the United States. Um, so we're, we're definitely going to dive into that later. But I wanted to touch, first of all, on, on DAI. Um, for those who don't know, it's a stable coin. And you mentioned, uh, and I watched a, a few of your presentations you've done in the past about getting paid in DAI mm -hmm. and how important that's been for you against that hedge in inflation. So why is DAI so important for the, the future of cryptocurrencies in general? Uh, DAI is interesting because I would say it is the most decentralized stablecoin currently out of uh, abundance of stablecoins that are out there. Um, originally, the first version, which we now call Psi, it was only backed by Ether. Hmm. So um, some people still refer to it as, as like the, the pure version um, of DAI. Um, this version, the current version of uh, multi-collateral DAI is backed by different assets. And while some of those assets can be centralized assets, the, the stable coin itself isn't. So it has no uh, blacklisting mechanism. There is no way uh, for any one entity to, to censor uh, you or the use of the token. Um, it is instantly auditable since everything is on chain. You can always go and see that uh, there is a certain amount of value backing uh, DAI. Like right now, there's around, there's almost half a billion. There's uh, 400 something million DAI in circulation, and they're backed by more uh, than a billion dollars in value. And you wow. can see that via the smart contract. So that is something that. Uh, you cannot do with with some of the others and 
I think those are some of the benefits that I see to using diet. There are, of course, certain drawbacks. So um, people who may be looking for, uh, who may value something uh, more than something else may see, okay, yeah, diet is the same point for me, or they might go to USDC or to Tether or, or another. There's, I think there's, uh, there's market for, for many of them. Yeah. And you bring up a good point though, with, with the, the difference between DAI and some of these other stable coins, and you touched on a few of those differences, but in your opinion, I, I, and maybe this is where I just don't understand enough about Tether or USDC. What are some of the biggest differences between the DAI and the USDCs and Tether? Yeah. Um, so USDC, you're trusting a central entity Coinbase that first uh, that they have the money uh, backing the the billion plus USDC because that is the the premise it is an IOU mm -hmm. um, they give you a token for one USDC and they say I do have one US dollars worth of value locked somewhere backing that token uh, USDT is um, mostly the same tether so they say I have a treasury of, I don't know how many billions. Um, and whenever people have tried to audit uh, that treasury, there's been problems and then there's been conflicting answers. Sometimes they said, yes, we are 100% backed. Then they said, no, maybe we're 70% fully backed. And then there's a 30% that it's either in debt or in instruments or in, um, I, I don't, I don't want to fud, but right. that's what I've, um, so they're IOU tokens, right? Okay. Um, and you need to trust a central entity that they are holding the value that is represented in those tokens. Uh, DAI, it is not centrally controlled. So it is controlled by a decentralized uh, autonomous organization. Anybody who owns the MKR token is eligible to vote on the protocol. And the assets, they're stored on chain. So they're audible and you can see that uh, that DAI is indeed backed. For every $1 worth of DAI, there's more than $3 uh, worth of other tokens. You know, there's, uh, there's Ether, there's uh, WBTC, there's USDC, um, there's, uh, there's a few more KNC, MANA, and, and they all back the coin. Excellent. Well, and that, I mean, to me, that really separates die because like, I, I know when I'm scrolling through Twitter, I'll see a million new, you know, USDT just got minted and it's like, where is this coming from and how is it back? So that, that was like a question that I had about this. And it seems like, I mean, die is obviously has a lot more backing with the, the collateral part of it, which for me is, is, is showing stability. Um, so very important stuff. Now, when it comes to uh, the U.S. dollar inflating, how, how does that affect DAI, if at all? Um, it does. <clears throat> I I always find it um, funny because it's uh, you know different perspectives. Um, here we have in Argentina we have over fifty percent, sometimes sixty percent inflation a year. Wow. Uh, places like Venezuela, it's in the thousands. The U.S., I think you have a natural healthy inflation. Okay. Uh, a lot of people disagree. Uh, the thing with that, yes, it does, it does track uh, the, the value of the U.S. dollar. So you could say that it, um, it devalues at the same rate as, as the U.S. dollar, right? One key difference is that in decentralized finance, in DeFi, the interest rates that you can get on your DAI or most of the other coins, they are so much higher that they offset any uh, inflation and it becomes negligible with uh, the associated risks, of course, mm -hmm. uh, inherent to you know, something new like, uh, uh, like DeFi. Okay. Um, now, I guess I'm curious to see, to understand too. Like, so what would happen if the the U.S. dollar was no longer the the standardized currency of the world? Does that affect die at all? Um, it would, but there is uh, there is something that major governance can do, which is peg the value of die 
to a different asset. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that that would be, uh, it would probably be controversial and it wouldn't be uh, a simple uh, politically, let's say. Uh, right. Technically, it's it's not that difficult. It's uh, it's changing one or two knots. Uh, it is done via governance, of course. There is no single one person that can do it. Um, but you could have DAI tracking a different um, a different currency, a basket of currencies, or something else. Okay. So it is possible. Okay. I appreciate uh, you sharing your insights there. Now, we're going to kind of shift gears over to DeFi. I know we were touching on that. Um, for those who are kind of just looking to get started with DeFi or interested in DeFi, because it, it seems to be the biggest buzz happening around the, the crypto space right now, what would you recommend for them of like where to get started or how to get started? Sure. Uh, my first recommendation and, and just as a warning is that there are plenty of risks. This is new technology and um, I try to mention risks as often as I can. I will, I will only do it once right now, but there are many risks and be informed. Uh, I would say somebody who's just getting started, there is an account called DeFi Dad. Uh, yes, I know Twitter and on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's run by a good friend of mine. His uh, YouTube videos are really good. Uh, he explains every part of a system and then spends the last five minutes talking about the risks of uh, everything that he discussed. I think that is a good place to start. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there's... There are so many different uh, projects available and he has videos for all of them. So starting there and starting slow, uh, not thinking that, uh, you know, they're gonna put in a dollar and they're gonna end up with five at the end of the week because uh, also the network right now, it's uh, a little bit unstable, high gas prices. So, but yeah, that, that's probably where I would start. Excellent. Um, I, yeah, I did. Funny enough, I just talked to DeFi Dad last week, and he's always really? giving me the inside scoop on a lot of these uh, new projects. And and obviously, very important for our, for our you know watchers that are viewers is the risk involved with it. And with that being said, I, I know he mentioned to me last week is smart contract bugs happen, um, and, and that's also a risk. So, in touching on that, what are some of the other biggest risks with DeFi? Uh, smart contract risk is one of the main ones, of course, that there is a bug. Then, um, you know, there's, uh, there's risk that you lose your private key or that you go to a website and you input your private key um, because, you know, you, you shouldn't put your private key anywhere, but it's a phishing site and, and you thought that you were doing right. There's, let's say somebody's leveraged and even though the protocol is decentralized because it runs on Ethereum. The UI was built by a company and the UI uh, I don't know, is not available. And let's say there's an open source version, but you don't know how to download it and you're leveraged and the price is going down and you just cannot access the UI to pay off uh, debt. Um, there's, you know, there, there are many. In the case of stable coins, there is risk of uh, you know, a token uh, or a stablecoin depegging, you know, being worth either too too much or or too low. Um, those are some of the ones I can I can think about, and there are plenty more. So the, when I use DeFi, I try to use uh, projects that I can run my own UI, for example, because mm -hmm. um, let's say I, this is just an example, mm -hmm. right? But um, well. Let's use Maker as an example. I, sure. I use Oasis.app uh, to uh, create DAI, right? To put in Ether and, and Mint DAI. So essentially taking out a loan. If for whatever reason the Oasis app is available, then somebody without the technical skills to interact with the smart contract directly, uh, let's say the price is going down and they could be liquidated just because they couldn't access the UI. So... Wow. 
I download almost everything I use. I have a local version running just in case. And then I have two or three ledgers just in case one, uh, you know, something happens to one, two or three cables because I've been in the middle of something and one of the cables stopped working. Oh. Redundant internet. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit of a fatalist, but uh, I, I do like to be insured against uh, as many things as, as I can possibly think. Yeah. I'm still it's... missing a, a generator. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Uh, but no, I mean, that's very important, though, to, to touch on, because with all that being said, there, there is a lot of risk in DeFi. However, the, the benefits, you kind of have to weigh those out, the risk versus rewards with getting involved with DeFi. Um, so back to DeFi, though, why is it so important for the ecosystem that that blockchain and crypto is building? Originally, the, the idea of DeFi was you know financial independence taking back ownership of of one's uh, financial future um, a sense of self determination i i think that is still there um you know the fact that that you own what you own and um you can access financial services from anywhere in the world as long as uh you know you have a computer and a private key with some ether that is, uh, that is, I think, still the 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 basic idea of of decentralized finance. Lately, uh, it's become a little bit askew, just because you know, as a as a technology progresses, there are more experiments, and we've seen many cool things, and we've seen personally, uh, I've seen things that. Uh, have on being scams without, um, even though I, uh, I participated, of course, because <laughs> uh, I try to participate in, 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 in everything just to learn, right? right. Um, there is one thing with increasing usage, and now that it's becoming popular, for example, DAI, the thing that uh, it's trying to be an unbiased currency for the world, it's become so expensive to use maybe not to send and receive, but to actually go in and create it, um, it's getting difficult to use. That's why I think in the end DeFi is gonna be good because uh, it'll push uh, people to build better technologies that uh, will make the blockchain faster. Yeah, and, uh, speaking on some of those experiments, I, I know last week the, the whole YAM experiment kind of uh, had, had a you know blowing up. Um, what was your some of your insights and biggest takeaways from that? And it, are these kind of projects that are pushing the boundaries a good thing for blockchain and DeFi? There were people who were in favor, people against. Personally, I thought it was an incredible experiment. Um, I, I participated as much as I could. The idea for Yam was inspired by many projects, including uh, you know, Yearn Finance with the the Yifi Wi-Fi Waifu mm -hmm. token that was uh, how to put it, immaculately uh, there was an immaculate conception of Yifi. It just one day it was there, and anybody uh, could could mine it. Anybody could um, could get it. It was not pre-mined. There were no VCs involved. It was just went in with some capital and you got um, you got the token back and with the token you could uh, influence and make decisions around the protocol yam took that idea and it experimented with many other things for example now there were eight different tokens from eight different DeFi projects that you could use to acquire yam of course you could buy it in the market but Let's say for, for a person who only had, let's say, MKR or LEND or SNX or COM tokens, which uh, were some of the ones that you needed to, uh, to mine YAM, your opportunity, like uh, your actual cost was near zero. It was only gas, right? You right. could put in capital and you would get YAMs. As long as nobody bought them in the open market, um, there, was, there was really zero, zero risk and zero risk to capital. And that's what I told most people because I reviewed um, 
the staking part of the smart mm -hmm. contracts because that was what I was interested in. It's like, as long as I, I'm not going to lose my money, that's then everything else. I should have looked at the rebaser because, yeah, we're going to get to it. <laughs> the idea for Yam, uh, it, it took uh, from different projects. So it was going to be a governance token, but it also had plastic supply somewhat like ample for it. So um, the, it tried to stay at around $1. So we checked the last 12 hours of Uniswap prices. And if it was above a dollar, it would, um, you know, it would um, increase supply, but it would use some of that to buy um, the, the YCRB token and put it in the treasury. But the problem was that there was a bug there that inflated the supply too much. So in the first two, in the first 24 hours, there were two rebases and the, um, the protocol automatically bought, I think like um, $750,000 worth of uh, Y curve and put it in the treasury, but it inflated the supply of itself of EM so much that uh, it couldn't be accessed and essentially governance contract was was bricked there was no way mm -hmm. to interact with governance they tried for the first 12 hours uh, and there was a whole campaign to save and to delegate uh, your yams uh, and it was good but it didn't work so uh, then it became what to do and they came up with you know yam version 2 and yam version 3 but i think that uh, it is a good experiment because it they in my opinion, they're trying to do something with it. Um, you know, they're they're playing with like three different. Uh, you know, they're playing with Ampleforth's rebasing. They're playing with uh, no premine inclusion of several protocols, and then the idea of governance that's going to come. I want to see what that's all about. So, if you have yams, you have until tomorrow to migrate to version two, and then sit tight because uh, it's going to be a while for version three because they're going to audit the smart contracts. Right. And that's something that, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Uh, I just want to finish uh, uh, about Yam, but saying that in their medium, they said this counter, they're not audited. There's no value unless, you know, what the community ends up thinking that there is. I, um, and I know the team personally, and I think they went about it the right way. DeFi is in such a crazy moment that it, it was blown out of proportion and yeah. Yeah. But, it, but the disclaimers were there. Exactly. It's like, I, I visited the website and it's first thing you see is this giant pop-up, like understand the risk. Um, I think it's awesome. I, I like, I love to see this people pushing the boundaries um, and acknowledging those risks is important. But like you said, staking your, your, you know, liquidity and that liquid pool, essentially you're just risking that, that gas fee, which I think a lot of people misunderstood because, you know, yams were being sold on the open market as this governance token. And those are the people that really got hurt with buying them on the open market instead of yield farming them through, uh, through their application. So I think it was, it was important to understand those two facets of what happened. Um, I love to see it and I, and I hope they, they continue to progress and I wish yam project the best with it. Um, so we're going to be kind of shifting gears again into more of the, the crypto and blockchain, like overarching questions here. So from where you sit today, what areas of the industry do you see evolving the fastest? Obviously the first and foremost that we've been speaking on is DeFi, but what other areas are you seeing evolve? Um, the, uh, what they're called, uh, level two solutions or scaling solutions. I see those evolving fast and it's almost like a, a necessity that, that they have to evolve fast because, um, Ethereum mainnet right now, the, the layer one, it's almost full. It is, we're now used to it, but, um, it is, it is very costly to interact with the, with the blockchain. The reason people keep interacting with it is mostly because they're they're making profits. There are all these uh, projects that give you a lot of yield on on your capital, so they keep using it. But um, it's going to become a whale only blockchain if this if this continues. So I see a lot of uh, work being done in layer two. 
you know, uh, optimistic rollups, uh, CK rollups, they're, they're ways to interact, um, you know, with a, a, another blockchain that ends up finalizing uh, its state on, on the Ethereum blockchain. It offers, of course, more scalability at the expense of, uh, you know, a little bit of security. And so there are drawbacks. But uh, I think that is advancing very rapidly. And even in DeFi, there are so many different um, uh, things that are one of my main interests is uh, risk and, you know, insurance. So I'm looking, I'm looking at Open, I'm looking at the Nexus Mutual. I, I believe those, those protocols are, are also going gonna to rise incredibly high. And yeah. The the one that I've I've been too much into DeFi lately that I have no idea how it is progressing, but identity on the blockchain, I think oh. that um, maybe I don't think that it's solved. I was gonna say maybe it's already solved, uh, but hopefully there there are advances there because there are many interesting things you can do if you can uh, trustlessly uh, you know verify that uh, you're interacting with a single person you can you can then get quadratic voting with the with you know less gameability and things like that yeah excellent point because i I know we have a a presidential election coming up here in a few months and it would be awesome to be able to to utilize like blockchain technology to say hey we don't need the mail-in ballots we can just everyone can do it from a computer or phone um, so really interesting stuff. Now, if, if there was one thing that you could look back and tell yourself when you first got involved with crypto, what would you tell yourself having known everything that you, you know today? Oh, uh, don't invest in the Dow. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I, I would say that uh, I would t- tell myself that there is so much information and to take it slow uh it feels when i joined you know in 2015 i felt that i was already late to the party <laughs> uh and and you know i know people joining now that think that they are late to the party and in fact i i think we're still very early so i would i would tell myself to just take it easy, to read a lot, to analyze uh, the risks, and to try to have a good time. It's uh, in the end, you know, the best thing I did uh, in Ethereum, the first two years, it was mostly me, my computer doing my work. The best uh, thing I did was opening up and opening a Twitter and talking to the rest of the Ethereum community. It is an incredibly nice and welcoming community. Um, just, you know, try to be a part of that and you will learn plenty. Yeah. I, I know I'm only kind of like a year into this whole thing uh, with really the first six months just being self-education. Um, and then once I got involved with Crypto Live Leak, like I've been reaching out to people like yourself and they've been absolutely welcoming. And I felt like I was super late to the game and there is, you're right, there is so much information because the umbrella for blockchain really covers almost every industry and it's going to have an impact on, on almost every industry that we know today. So it's exciting and I'm excited to be here. So I'm glad um, you share that same excitement and thank you for being so welcoming for, for everyone new to the space, including myself. Um, now, we, yeah. Um, I, I, we're going to circle back here on kind of what we first were touching on, but how do you envision the role of central banking digital currencies? And do you think this is going to be a thing where it'll start like region by region, or do you think it will kind of be one big broad sweep where, um, where they kind of make this ruling? I've, I've thought about it before. I, I have theories. My theories always end up turning uh, not to be correct. I don't think um, so blockchains are, are are a game of of cooperation right and um, of public cooperation I don't know if um, I think those type of um, coins they they defeat the purpose a little bit 
So you still have, you know, uh, what is it? You're going to have nation states, each one with their own, and then maybe a, a bigger one uh, controlling all of those. It's, uh, I, I don't know how that's going to play out. My hope is that one of the tinier countries takes uh, a calculated risk and just does it, does their own token on a public blockchain. I hope it would be Ethereum because that's that's where the value is. Instead of because otherwise I feel like they're they're gonna end up being you know silos um, that have no good way of uh, uh, of you know transacting with one another un unless you build bridges and then you're back almost to doing the traditional banking system, but you slap the blockchain on it somehow. I, yeah, I rambled a bit. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. No, no, no. I, I think those are all like valid points because it's like, we're, we're looking at this legacy system. We know it's old. We know it's, we know it's broken. And how do we integrate blockchain into all this? And it's like, you know, we have that solution. I think it's like, you look at it, it's like die. Does it make sense where every single country would be transacting with die and, um, you know, I, I, I hope so. Like I hope there's one day where there's one thing where you can go anywhere in the world and spend it. Um, but I, only time will really tell us that. So I, the one fear that I have is where it is siloed and it's, it's being tracked. And cause I think at the end of the day, you know, anonymity is so important when it comes to that central banking currency. So it's going to be interesting to see, I know here in Boston, the federal reserve it has teamed up with MIT to start researching and, and, trying to figure out how they want to implement it, but it's, it's going to be years in the making. So like you said, this is all very early stuff and it's, it, we're here kind of on the ground floor. So it's interesting to see. Um, now we have the last round of questions here. This is the, the Fuego round, the fire round. Um, these are more kind of personal questions just to get to know you as a person. So what person, place, thing, or idea has had the biggest impact on your life so far? Oh, um, it was probably reading the never ending story when I was 10. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it has nothing to do with the, what I do now, but it opened up uh, my mind to different things. I, I grew up with my dad pushing me to engineering and my mom to uh, arts and literature. <clears throat> and I ended up doing a little bit of both. So, I think that was the moment when I realized that I, yeah, that I should be open to, you know, not become just a technocrat, but to open up my mind to, uh, to the arts. Awesome. Now, if you had one wish for the crypto and blockchain space, what would it be? Wow. One wish. Uh, I wish that I would never have to read about Bitcoin versus Ethereum ever again. <laughs> uh, I, I, work on a, I work on Ethereum and have for five years and I don't, I don't own uh, any Bitcoin anymore. But I hate to see the, the communities fighting. You know, Bitcoin is uh, number one crypto by market cap. Ethereum is number two. I personally think that Ethereum has more value and it's going to become the number one. But I don't go out of my way on Twitter to correct people and start fights. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that is my, my main wish, but it's, it's high up there. Well, that's a good wish because I, that's kind of one of the first things that I noticed when I jumped in this space. It's, it's very tribal where it's like, yeah. you know, this is, this is my crew and this is their crew and it's us against them. And I think it, like sometimes we fail to realize we're all on the same team here. Like we're all trying to do something great and change the world. It, you know, there's different ways we're going to do that. And there's different pathways to do that. Um, and we, I think at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. We got to realize that sometimes. Completely. Yeah. Um, now, last question for you here for the Fuego round. What is your favorite food that you cannot live without? Oh, um, empanadas. Ah, <laughs> Empanadas. Uh, I haven't been eating empanadas all that much, 
just because I, I went on a diet uh, when the quarantine started. I've lost 25 kilos. Wow. So 50 something pounds. Yeah. So I don't eat them quite that much. Um, I think that's my favorite food. Awesome. And quick backstory. I actually reached out to Mariano uh, a few weeks ago. I made a boo-boo and I thought I sent you know, funds to a smart contract. It ended up being a, another wallet I didn't know that auto-populated. So long story short, Mariano was gracious enough to respond to me on Twitter. And um, we really appreciate you coming on today's show. Very insightful stuff. Um, Mariano Conti from MakerDAO, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.